Now we're going to focus on the dark areas of our map with Justina Ray, whose favorite place to be is 100 miles away from the nearest road. Justina is a wildlife biologist and the founding director of Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Justina and her WCS colleagues bring science and their expertise to bear on policy and land use decisions throughout Canada, but particularly in northern boreal and Arctic regions, the dark areas. She served for nine years as co-chair of the Terrestrial Mammals Subcommittee of COSAWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, which is our Canadian equivalent of the Endangered Species Act. We call it the Species at Risk Act. Justina is a champion for caribou and wolverine. She's also a champion of women in science, motivated by watching the workplace struggles of her own mother a generation earlier. A couple of days ago, I was in Santa Barbara at NC's where I was working and I met and well, I know, and was chatting with a young scientist who many of you probably know, Emily Darling. Emily, are you here? And just, I mentioned Justina's name, and Emily just started enthusing about, you know, what an incredible mentor Justina has been for her as she's learning the policy and science ropes and what an outstanding leader you are for so many conservation scientists in Canada. Justine is squirming, but it's true. Justina's idea of success is resolving problems that at first may seem insurmountable, which makes her the perfect co-leader of our conference and our next speaker. Welcome, Justina. Thank you so much, um, Nancy. I'm going to take a little while to recover. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Elder, for welcoming us. Thank you to my co-speakers and the journalists for taking time to be here. And welcome to Toronto. Um, so uh, 10 years ago, I walked into an elevator with the CEO of a, of a, a Canadian mining company. And we were attending the same event celebrating Caribou. And he used this occasion to turn to me and say something, it was related to plans about a particular mine, and he just said, like, what's the problem with a hole in the ground? Why make a big deal about it? The footprint is tiny, and it's a vast wilderness. Scarcely three years later, this, uh, you know, after the mine had been built, the same company put in plans for a second mine about three kilometers away and started a new assessment process, almost as if the old one had never happened. So I've often thought about this conversation and the both entitled and somewhat condescending look on the face of the CEO as he sort of patted me on the head, and figuratively, of course, and sort of as if to say, there, there, don't worry about it. This is just a small mine. You don't need to be bothered by it. We've got a lot of land out there. And so, in addition to my discovery that day that actually elevator speeches are a thing, <laughs> and, and it's a, probably a good idea for all of us to have a few of them in our back pocket, uh, there was actually, um, this episode exemplified for me two sort of major truths uh, that I've been thinking about over those past 10 years that relate to uh, the conservation future, when, especially when we look at those dark areas of the map. And the first one is that we as a society and governments in charge take for granted and don't place a ton of value on our natural heritage treasures until they become scarce. And then the second one that this vignette demonstrated to me was that we make decisions only one project at a time we're seldom proactive where we can be. We never place limits on our activity in advance. And we have an overblown sense of confidence that we will do no harm. So with respect 
to, I'm going to talk about both of these in turn. So with respect to the human propensity to take our natural treasures for granted, it's easy to understand why. When you look at this map, a lot of you from the States are like, what are you complaining about? Canada is indeed characterized by vast landscapes of roadless areas, uh, snows where there's been no significant land conversion in boreal and northern Arctic regions in particular. And if we look at the lights in, in Canada, I know there's no, no map, uh, no boundary there, but right at the 49th parallel, we can imagine exactly where that is that we share with the U.S. And by and large, that reflects where most human settlement is. And it is true what they say, actually, and I looked it up. It is true that um, the, I looked up the calculations that about 85 to 90 percent of the Canadian population lives within 100 miles of the U.S. border. And although we are the second largest country in the world, uh, we are about the size of the U.S., but we only have one-tenth of the population. So those statistics are rather, rather sobering. And, 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 but although we still can't see it here, though, it's important to understand that our footprint extends a great deal further than those lights. Um, and this is reflective of, of, of the fact that we're really a natural resource-driven economy. And while not laced with lights, there are, thousands, mil, there are many, many, many roads underneath that dark canopy. Resource roads, we're talking about logging roads, seismic roads, roads transition-wise, and so forth, that extend pretty far into the dark, particularly oil and gas footprint in the western sedimentary basin. But still, there is a lot of roadless area. And as for the rest of the dark areas that remain, in spite of our international reputation as like really nice and polite people and lovers of wilderness, um, make no mistake that Canada is not in this situation because of any foresight, because of any protective instincts on the part of our governments. There have been multiple attempts over the years. In the last 50 years, there have even been commissions and many discussions about how to develop the North. And, uh, and so we are where we are simply because we haven't gotten there yet. And if we look at the history of human behavior in some ways, that the old expression that you don't know what you've got until it's gone prevails. And while the Atlantic cod story can become kind of a cliche, I have to uh, mention it because it really is so, uh, so such a well-documented example of, of sort of three major things, an overzealous appetite on our part, the consequences of ignoring solid evidence, warnings in advance year after year, and then, the con and then also the profound pains of so little progress in restoring this resource after it bottomed out 30 years ago. And as evidenced by our ever-growing list of species at risk, uh, that the, uh, we have all too many that species that serve as indicators of deterioration um, that we don't pay attention to until really it's too late. And we don't have very many good examples of restoring stuff once it's hit bottom. There is good evidence that we should not, at this point, take any of these intact areas for granted. Namely, that on a global scale, these are becoming more and more scarce. Northern Canada and Alaska actually stand out in the world with an area of intact roadless forests that still occur here. They're at least as large an extent as the Amazon these days and considerably less fragmented than Asia and Central Africa. And we are losing these intact areas by one measure, 3 million square kilometers over a 15 year period recently. Understanding also though is increasing for the disproportionate value of intact forests, namely to biodiversity, carbon, water provision, indigenous culture, maintenance of human health. But in spite of this knowledge and experience, and also that we well know that it makes good business sense to think proactively and strategically, but you know, in advance of problems while we still have them, blah de blah de blah, um, that's not how we do things. It's of course not how we work when it comes to protecting our natural capital. And decision-making systems reflect this. And I'm not talking about land use planning. Land use planning does occur in a lot of these areas where zoning decisions are made. Um, and these are the dominant and important process in many areas. Generally speaking, though, when land use plans do indicate in a general sense where development is welcomed as opposed to areas where there's going to be protection, they are quite silent and provide no direction on the pace, scale, intensity, complexity, and upper limits of development that the region can tolerate. And this leads me to the second major issue that was raised for me by this, this meeting with the, the CEO guy. 
And that's the reactive and piecemeal manner in which we make decisions about developing an area. And since I'm focusing on these remote areas, this is probably a good time to talk about roads. Um, access to remote areas is, of course, a prerequisite for any development. You know, if you need you get transmission, energy, and so on and so forth. Yet, when roads are, um, and, and it's not uncommon for agencies, public agencies, to fund and plan and be responsible for building in roads so that they will come, so that you can promote development, so that access is going to be easier. Yet the potential future cumulative effects that will arise are rarely considered, particularly in the face of a changing climate. And the trade-offs between the costs and the benefits on, from an economic, social, cultural, and ecological impacts are rarely discussed in advance. And so if, in fact, if a, boat, a road is built for a, mine, for a mine, in most environmental assessment processes, that road will be considered entirely separately from the mine. And where the mine might be subjected to a lengthy environmental assessment, the road kind of gets a, a sort of a pass. And it's rarely considered. And it, yet it's those first roads that some of us are calling keystone decisions. They can have disproportionate effects when they're punched through uh, an important area, but they're also growth inducing. And we're arguing for changes in business as usual practices to where these projects receive major instead of minor consideration and kickstart serious conversations about future scenarios of change in the region. So neither of these two concerns I've raised have changed much in the last 10 years, unfortunately, and since my elevator conversation. And our propensity to take both our areas, our intact areas for granted, and the state of our business as usual decision-making process are pretty much the same as at that time and remain my biggest worries about the future. But I do want to close by highlighting some important and hopeful shifts in the last 10 years the first is exemplified by Larry's talk before me and what is referred to in the National Advisory Panel report that he talked about as leadership through con re reconciliation. This path for conservation recognizes in the words of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that, quote, reconciliation between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians from an Aboriginal perspective also requires reconciliation with the natural world. And this is bolstered by an increasing number of court decisions that have helped define land, treaty, and human rights for Indigenous people in Canada. And the report issued by, in March by the Indigenous Circle of Experts calls out connections between intact ecological biodiversity and thriving cultural diversity, as well as the turning point we are in in history. And, um, and while this is, of course, relevant to all of Canada, the dark regions of the map are the homelands of indigenous peoples who constitute the majority of the human population there. And I'll, that's how I'll close, and thank you very much. Justina had three seconds to spare. <laughs>